My name is Nancy Fulton, and this is an interview with Bridget Fitzgerald. If you have any questions that you want to ask over the course of the event, I hope you'll send an email to nancy.fulton at yahoo.com. And with that, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. And with your permission, Bridget, I'll spend a few minutes just sort of introducing you and so that uh, we can dive into the conversation and people have an understanding sort of of who you are. Is that okay? Sounds great. Great. So tonight I'm interviewing Bridget Fitzgerald. She's an actress, a comedian, and model. She's also a member of National Lampoon's sketch comedy team, making sketch comedy podcast heard by half a million monthly listeners. She has a web series, Smiley Bridge TV, which has had um, a quarter million views, and she attributes some of that success to two audio books, How I Exiled My Inner Bitch, which she acted in, and I Humpty, which she produced as well as acted in. And you can learn more about her by visiting www.bridgetfitzgerald.com. And the reason that I wanted to interview um, Bridget is because she's made a real investment in producing audio content, as well as a SAG New Media web series. And it's, it's helped her get more and better acting roles, as well as writing gigs. And it's helped her to establish herself as a producer, a co-producer, and a director, which um, has broadened her careers and the number of opportunities that she has here in the entertainment industry. She's also been asked to work as a judge in writing contests, which um, creates a whole bunch of new opportunities and relationships, and she consults with those who are producing web series, podcasts, and audio books. So having said all that, Bridget, do you want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit of, about how you decided to come out to Los Angeles, what your objectives are for your career? I think that will help people sure. understand sort of the road that you've taken. Sure, absolutely. I am an actor and a comedian and a model, actor, writer, model. And now, in order to get uh, more work for myself, I, I do produce, I direct, I do all these things. And I feel like that's kind of where the industry is at right now. Actually, I started by writing. I was primarily a writer when I was living in New York. And then I uh, started doing improv because I have a, have a great uh, – <laughs> I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live. I wanted to be your next big, you know, comedy Star. I wanted to be the lead of a romantic comedy feature film. I wanted to be so many things. Uh, and those were basically things that enhanced that comedic voice. So I spent, I started taking classes at Upright Citizens Brigade. And I started acting in as many small student films as I could get my hands on as a, whatever, <laughs> if it paid pizza, I had pizza, you know, whatever it was, just to get the experience that I needed. And I was outperforming. Uh, five to seven nights a week doing improv or stand-up, which I also did for two years. Wow. Um, so then uh, I was also doing modeling, um, print modeling uh, for corporations like IBM, Fiat, um, Always, uh, all these different brands uh, to try and save up money to move out west because I really wanted to be the lead of a romantic comedy feature film. Um, and so that was where I was going to come because this was going to have more opportunities for me, especially as I got my um, SAG after card. I wanted to open myself up to as many um, union jobs as possible. And I feel like Los Angeles is a great place for that. Mm -hmm. So I saved up and I moved across the country. It took me uh, a little while to do it, but I, I moved across the country like so many of us out there probably listening have done, uh, come from all over to be in LA in the city of New York cinematic dreams <laughs> and that's what I started doing here as I started doing the same thing that I had done in New York where I was doing these short films I was uh, producing uh, directing oh I'm sorry I skipped over one very important thing uh, Musi which is a pilot that I a sitcom pilot that I started in uh, co-wrote with my friend and uh, co-star uh, Lauren Hunter uh, and then won a, a the best of a, a film festival called Katya, which is in mm -hmm. New York. And then using that, uh, I asked Time Warner, well, I had a, a I sold it through Time Warner online, um, wow. through their on-demand store. Mm -hmm. So that was like a really cool thing for me to have in my back pocket uh, to bring over here because I had uh, co-directed on that, I'd produced it, I'd written it, I'd starred in it. And so it gave me just a really good boost of confidence as I came here to Los Angeles. So when I came here to Los Angeles, um, I started doing 
more of the same. A short film I did uh, that I wrote uh, called Save the Date, uh, which uh, went to a couple film festivals. And then while I was out here, I started you know, auditioning for as many things as I could. And one of the things that I did first was what we'll talk about, um, I guess, in a, in a little bit, which was that how I exiled my inner bitch um, mm-hmm. audiobook, which was looking for comedic actresses. And that's how I really got my feet wet in that mm-hmm. audiobook world, which I think that so many of us uh, who are people who are comedic or who are people who are just uh, actors looking to create a, a side job for themselves or, or new opportunities for themselves, not really a side job, it is acting, but mm-hmm. it's also acting on a timetable you can control, which I think is wonderful for flexibility for an actor's schedule to be able to say, okay, we have these deadlines and you can make those deadlines um, on the same schedule of, you know, auditioning, which fluctuates. Mm-hmm. I think that's very true. Um, and, that, and then um, did did you have the National Lampoon role when, when you came out here? Did you require that the, the work, the opportunity to work with National Lampoon's web series um, once you arrived? Like how did that, how did that come, up, come to pass? Well, right before I left New York, I was working on a sketch with the um, create one of the creative VPs of uh, National Lampoon, Marty Dundix. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, and I made a, a, a sketch comedy video that you can, uh, I believe, you can see it on my YouTube page, which is YouTube slash Smiley Bridge, YouTube dot com slash Smiley Bridge, um, and uh the so I had that connection, but then when I moved out to Los Angeles, a friend who was visiting uh was like, Hey, have you ever done this podcast? and got me connected to Barry Link, who's the guy out here who runs that. And so that's how I ended up um working with National Lampoon out here, which was wonderful. That was I mean they do it at uh Sunset Gallery, which is relatively close to where I am and it's just a great opportunity for me to go and meet them and go and you know work and really do all these different sketch characters which really are fulfilling to me as a comedy actor and as a comedy creator mm-hmm. and and working on a podcast is it a, do you enjoy is it similar to audiobooks in the sense that um you get to do perform get to do great performances but it's you know, it doesn't have the overhead of like uh dressing in costumes or um necessarily uh you know the, the all the makeup all and all of the hassle i mean in other words is that one of the aspects that you like it's more controllable there's less flexibility you don't have to worry about you know rain happening and stopping the shoot is that helpful to you there's ab- oh yeah i think it's absolutely much more flexible and forgiving than other formats because you can do a new take so quickly even if you uh even if there's some sort of weird audio glitch or something you could just stop and start the line over and keep going or just do a fresh take and it's so much more inexpensive than if you had to stop a reel of Mm -hmm. film or you know shut down like well you know if you're on a set like I I was on a set for uh was it not ultra low budget but the next one up uh modified modified low budget budget, um and like that's like a huge amount of people like to work with that sort of budget and then like have to do a retake is a lot more intensive in terms of financially intensive as well as everything else so it's Mm -hmm. just like for me like it's basically like a really golden opportunity for people to be able to get their voice out there and be heard and grow a fan base you know Mm -hmm. Do you do you actually enjoy the the process? One of the things I think is kind of um, sad about working in Hollywood, having worked with a lot of actors and a lot of writers and a lot of directors, is that because there's so much stress associated with making money in the industry, and there's so much, uh, to some degree, when the projects are really expensive, there's a lot of creative constraint. In other words, you know, we can't shoot everything. We don't have an infinite number of hours. We don't have an infinite number of days. So people are in a position where this is the role you're going to play it exactly the way the director wants it played exact you know right this exact second and there's not an opportunity to to kind of workshop or experiment with anything because 
there's just it's just too expensive. Um, having produced audio, um, some audio um, dramas myself, and having worked in audio books, one of the things I really like is that it's actually more creative. And uh, do you think it? Do you think actors benefit from the opportunity to actually experiment a little bit more than they experiment with and collaborate more with fellow actors and with the production staff? Because it's not such a rigid hierarchy. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a lot more. I mean, there's always a, a level of um, creativity and a level of communication, and every project is different. But I will say that um, a lot of I've gotten to do a lot of wonderful creative things through audiobooks and through the podcast. The other audiobook that I um, did after uh, How I Excelled My Inner Bitch, which also was a beautiful experience and a great chance to interact with the actual writer of the book, Miv Evans, who is just a phenomenal writer. She's just a, a treasure. Um, she had produced that, and she was giving me so much direction and feedback, and we got to play a lot and do different levels on takes and things, and that was great. Um, as an actor uh, and as a member of a team to be able to, to have that time and that um, really the, the ability to do that, um, to kind of take the time because it wasn't as expensive to create per minute. Um, for the other one, for Hi, for I Humpty, which is the one that I um, produced on as well as uh, acted in, uh, there was so much more... Um, well, frankly, so much more leeway in that because the uh, writer of the source material, he um, let me basically run rampant with 50 plus audio characters. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I Humpty is a fractured fairy tale book for grownups based on a blog. Mm -hmm. um, so what it was, was every single chapter was a different, you know, story with its own set of characters and its own you know, voices that could be made. And for me, that was just like, you know, I loved every second of it, coming up with all these different voices and all these different options and, you know, making those creative choices that sometimes you don't get to make um, because you are ultimately creating the director's vision when you're on a set, when you're in a film, um, or when you're in a play even, um, you're ultimately creating a vision created by the entire team. Whereas in an audiobook, you kind of have more of that authority to make creative decisions, which is, um, I, I mean, enticing. Or with um, a podcast, it's also really fun, at least for us at Lampoon. Um, <laughs> we always take time to do a man on the street segment, mm -hmm. which I think that listeners of the audio podcast love um, because every week we get to just improv and do all these different characters and we will often just make each other laugh with all these unexpected quips that we're throwing back and forth in the room with each other and it's just this very joyous creation while we're all really you know what what the great thing that happens when you put a lot of really funny really talented people together and you let them play you know that's that's what you get is the the that segment of the lampoon. I think I think and I think that's one of the things that's really important about working in um working in audiobooks and working in um audio audio dramas and podcasts and so forth is the fact that it's an opportunity to collaborate in a way that is otherwise really difficult to do in Hollywood and also it does provide sort of the ability to connect with new actors. I'm, and new um, writers and new directors on a regular basis, and it uh, so it's functional networking in addition to the fact, and it's pleasant networking. It's and it's it's creative um, networking. You you get a chance to meet people and you get to see whether or not you click because there's a certain magic. Some people just some people can riff off each other in a way that is not um, is unexpected. You know. And and you don't get that opportunity to play around whenever you're just you're working on a sort of a studio production, you know it's very constrained. It's kind of like the best thing in the world is to get booked on a sitcom, but every single second of a sitcom is, is scheduled to the fifteen thousandth degree. And deciding to do anything off the wall is a good a good way to ensure that you don't get an opportunity to come back. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, it is it is nice to have that uh, ability to well, even the time constraint, honestly, of a, a podcast because you're the one putting out like if you were say putting out a, a sitcom again that's for air, then you would have to have it a certain length of time every time in mm-hmm. order to have the commercial breaks that you need for the ad sponsors that are making that television program possible as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like one of the great things about a podcast or an audio book is that you can kind of control that ultimate length and put it in a creative, use your creative judgment and your creative taste to kind of do that as well. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, go ahead. No, you were, you, I, I, sorry. Oh, (laughs) Well, it's like you could see like how directors like do a director's cut of a film. It's kind of that, that same vibe where it's like, okay, well, I we would love to make this longer and this part more dramatic, but, but because other people are, you know, have their needs or we have an ultimate time limit on this, we have to cut out this, this, and this just for time, just for the runtime alone. So it's nice to have that ability to say, okay, well, this, week the podcast is going to be 36 minutes this week it's going to be 42 minutes like there's a little bit more stretch and give when you're doing podcasts and audiobooks I definitely agree and I, I the other thing I like is um, I'm kind of a, very much a fan of um, theater I and I think I was mentioning to you I very much enjoy mm-hmm. I like what there's something different about watching an actor doing a stage performance or doing a dramatic performance that particularly something that seems like it would sort of fit on a stage than doing something that's highly produced, the kind of work that people are producing. I mean, I find myself thinking, you know, would a streetcar named Desire, if it came out today and it hadn't been, we didn't know who Tennessee Williams was, I mean, that's just an interesting piece. That's not going to end up on TV. It might not get to be a film. It's just too intense, right? But it's totally totally mm-hmm. the kind of thing that can end up in theater, and it's also the kind of thing that can become an audio drama. It's a, it's a risk you can afford to take, which is not something it, – it's kind of – it's a safe place to take risks, and it's one of the few safe places to take risks here in Los Angeles. In New York, where there's a stage on every sta- stage on every corner, you know, and – there's some there's more so much more support for the arts there's it's more of an opportunity to put up projects that are kind of edgy here in Los Angeles it's very hard to get an audience for a lot of edgy things and it requires a lot of you know it's it can be a dramatic activity but putting if you want to do something kind of edgy you know um a podcast or an audio drama um or turning it into something that you that you write down and turn into an audio book that's something it's not a very big risk it, and it's an presents an opportunity to kind of do work you wouldn't otherwise be able to do at all. Absolutely. And I I feel like as a uh, as a creative person that if you firmly believe in your vision, you will find other people who also key into that. And the beauty of having a podcast or an audio book is that you can put this out and let it, let the audience find it. You know what I mean? Like you can put out at your craziest whatever it is and then know that someone out there on the internet or someone out there who is into podcasts might discover it and think that you're fantastic and then you know you have this new base which is actually kind of what happened when I started doing I mean I don't know if it's too early to talk about this no, part no, but when I started doing um Smiley Bridge TV which uh was my one of my three web series that I made. One, um, I've gone and, and made a couple web series. One is the admin, which uh, was great, and we did in New York. And then this this one, um, I saw that the Ovation TV was trying to find projects like web series or art projects or multimedia, um, and uh, to to be a finalist in this contest. Uh, for a $5,000 stipend. And so I was like, okay, well, I would like to do this. And I presented it. And then I told everyone that I knew about it. And if anyone's ever done fundraising, you know what it's like. You tell everyone, you tell everyone, you tell everyone. Every day you tell everyone about why 
you, why you firmly believe in what you what you believe. And Smiley Bridge TV was something that I came up with because I literally wanted to make this world a better place. Mm-hmm. I literally said to myself, I think that there are too many things that are put downs or gross comedy out in the world, and I don't want that out in the world. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm a trained comedy writer and a comedy actor and a comedy maker, director, producer, editor. I've done all of them. Mm-hmm. Cut trailers for uh clients before like I've done everything uh so I said well here's what I want to do I want to put something that just really sketch comedy for the dork in us it's Mm -hmm. sketch comedy that doesn't have put downs that doesn't have gross humor that doesn't have any of the these uh you know low low bar things I want it to be this positive uplifting experience and so that's what I said in my video and that's what I told everyone over and over again my friends, my family, and then, you know, I opened this world, and I just said, here's what I'm doing at Rocket Hub, and and I ended up being a finalist for this um, stipend, and because of that, I met a lot of new fans all over the country that I did not even know about. They didn't know I existed. I didn't know they existed, and it was this beautiful mesh where they were like, we want to be a part of that, and I was like, well, this is what I'm doing. Please please be a part of that. Please be a part of my team. So that's what we did. I met people and I really, we raised enough for the entire season and then some, and it was amazing. And because of that, because of all these generous people all over the country, I got to make Smiley Bridge TV. And then because of that, we made a quarter million people laugh and made their lives a little bit better. And I was so happy to be able to be a part of that. Like I was working crazy, crazy hours, you know, to try and, and get it done and to make everybody happy. And I just didn't care. You know, when you're, when you're excited about something, you just kind of, I don't know, it's the only time I forget to eat yeah. <laughs> when I'm so excited about a project and I'm so um, just stoked and, and pumped for it. Well, and the interesting So that's thing what is- I did. The interesting thing is it's like the opportunity to do that, um, it, the opportunity to do that is critical if you want to if you want to have creative freedom going forward. What, one of the things I've noticed is the people who are successful in having incredibly successful careers that get a chance to have their own voice is that they take, they seize creative freedom. They, they you know, um, Robin Williams was hanging out in New York City being a mime in um, Central Park. At no point is that what one would call a responsible fiscal, you know, concept, right? It's like this is not a money-making venture. Um, but he was very successful doing that, he, and he he was remembered for doing it at the time, and he mastered, you know, how to take an audience by storm, how to make how to make not just um, not just talk funny, but but movement funny, um, and it and it led. That and his work at stand up, which again is not a fiscally sensible thing to do on from any standpoint ever <laughs> turned into him having turned into him and being able to build a whole career um and, and we got it and then later on he chose to do drama when people said, "Well, you know you're just a comic, and I think to be successful as a creative professional, you have to constantly create opportunities for yourself to do the kind of work that only you can do to set yourself apart instead of being um, a clone or um, somebody who is filling is delivering somebody else's vision of a particular character or somebody else's kind of story you know so I think when I look at the work that you've done it really seems like you've I don't know it just seems pretty apparent that you're going to be successful in terms of establishing your own voice and finding your own fans and those things will lead to you having the opportunity to to do more projects of the kind you like um, and to gain more fans and become more successful over time well thank you so much that's so sweet of you to say I honestly I just I I hope that I'm very touched by that I don't know what else to say about that. That's very sweet of you to say, Nancy, and I appreciate it. Um, well, no, I mean, but it's actually true. I mean, you didn't have to take it. Choosing to, you know, you you leap into the fray and go, 
I'm going to create a web series, which, you know, if you're especially if you're doing a web series and you, you go to the trouble to make a new media web series, so you're doing it following the rules of those kinds of projects and especially That's doing true. it multiple times. I mean, it's a thing, you know, and it and it represents yeah. not just you employing yourself, but other people in, in frequently, you know. I was very grateful about that because as a SAG artist, a SAG actor, it was to do it as a SAG new media meant a lot to me because I really wanted to be able to make it be a real opportunity for other actors because so many like web web series or whatever will ask actors to do it for a deferred pay, which, you know, your rent is never deferred. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I wanted to make sure you know, that I respected the other actors who were on this as well. And so every contract was signed and every one was taken care of, you know. So that was important to me as a, an actor and as a person, that we all were on the same team as far as that went. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if you treat other people with respect, then you'll get that respect back. And that's how you create a really good creative opportunity. And that's how you make a really good creative team. Well, and I also think it means that when people think about somebody they want to work with next time, they go, "Oh yeah, I want to work with I want to work with her again because you know she's very professional and because you know she plays she does things by the book and she plays by the rules. She's she's not trying to cut corners. She's not trying to. So that's the person I want to work with. There's so much there's so much um, of the entertainment industry which is necessarily in flux. You know, one never knows if it's going to rain, you know, when you're doing a shoot. One never knows if the audience is going to turn up. You never know if somebody um, – there's just so much uncertainty all the way across the board. So I think the entertainment industry tends to – and people in the entertainment industry tend to value and to promote people who turn up and deliver and consistently deliver um, in a fashion that makes you think, okay, if I hire this person – and something goes wrong or something's unexpected, um, it won't be their fault. And then also they'll help work past it so that we can all go, you know, we can make it so the project isn't a dead loss. You know, it actually comes to fruition. So I think you're when you talk about doing the new media series and doing it, doing it by the book, making sure people are getting paid, you're sort of setting yourself. People notice that. Well, I, I really agree with, uh, that and with the point that you made earlier about how you grow your network and how you learn how how you make these connections with other people because the connections that I made with Smiley Bridge TV like those actors are in my group now you know what I mean and those the producers are in my group now and we've like sent each other information on different projects or you know, kept each other in the loop on different opportunities. And, you know, that's what's going to get you through the entire career is all the stops along the way and all the people in your tree. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I feel like whether it's an audio book or a, a podcast or a new media series, these are all opportunities for you to grow your tree and to grow branches in different directions that you weren't expecting that could be quite beneficial to you you know I mean thanks to all of these different people not only have I made that connection but I've also had the enriching experience of having made these where you know things do go wrong anyone who's ever self-produced or or directed know that during the production things don't go as planned that's why you have to plan for the unexpected you know what I mean like that's why you add in cushion times that's why you add in a cushion on your budget or whatever so that you make sure that and something goes wrong because it something weird will happen while you're on set and you will be prepared to have to face that hurdle and get over it mm -hmm. like uh i mean i had an actor drop out of one of the sketches at the last minute. So I was memorizing lines for a sketch that I wrote at the last minute to make sure that the people who had donated the money wouldn't have spent it in vain, you know, so I could use this uh, very expensive prop that I had gotten, which was a, a bikes because we had written one sketch, of, I had written one sketch about bikes and this other uh 
restaurant was kind enough to donate uh, their restaurant to us for that, to let us shoot inside of it, which was amazing and a wonderful, amazing, incredible opportunity. So I didn't want to waste these two things. So I had to just improvise and work with what I had and use those skills. And now that it's been some time since then, I'm like, what an incredible blessing in disguise that was because you know sometimes you get scripts at the last minute and you just have to memorize and get through it and get that you know you don't do it then you don't get that opportunity so it's really like honing the skills that you need the skills Mm -hmm. to evolve I mean as a writer I'm sure other people listening to this are writers or they are producers or they are directors or they are fellow actors uh, everybody knows that part of this industry is change and evolution. Mm-hmm. It's part of the collaborative process. So being able to hone the skills of being able to fluctuate and change and evolve with these changing circumstances, that's also a reward of having created your own project. I think that's a very, and I think it's an important one. Also, I think it when you create networks like this, especially networks that are very functional and they get things done and they can, they, people count, learn that they can count on one another. They individuals identify, okay, this person can be trusted. This person can be trusted. This is the kind of character. This person does amazingly well. This guy's brilliant as a, as a, this kind of writer. When, Mm -hmm. when, when one person is successful or when, you know, as people become more successful, they, they raise up in the industry, they start, getting projects they get larger and they start looking for the people they could count on and they don't know all of these people in the industry there's a million people in the industry but the people that they can count on were the guys that they remember working with when they literally had nothing and managed to put together something good so they go okay that guy you know i know they haven't done anything big before but you know i've seen them be very successful with literally no with nothing to work with and so I'm going to pick this person to work with me because I I know personally that I personally can count on them and I have, already have a relationship with them. And I think it's this is why you see um, groups of people come up in Hollywood. Like you'll see one of the things I think Saturday Night Live does, funny, funny, funny you should mention it, is the fact that you see people be successful on Saturday Night Live and then they will pull one they they pull one another onto other projects when they leave. You know, you'll have people go you'll see the teams of people end up working together as writers or in, as an actors because they worked on that show together and that's how they became acquainted. You're just, you're creating exactly that same kind of environment when you build um, a web series or a, um, a podcast that, um, that gathers an audience, et cetera. Can you talk um, actually for a few minutes? So one of the things that you mentioned that you do is, and that makes sense that you actually help people um, create new media projects and you can you actually do some consulting and stuff. Can you talk um a little bit about um uh how you can how you help people um with new media projects or putting together or, you know putting together these kinds of projects um if they haven't done it before? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um there's a lot of uh for some people it can be very overwhelming to to go through the new media process. And it was at first for me, the first time I did it, I was very nervous. And I thought, oh, my gosh, there's so much paperwork. It was just this big, scary, nebulous hurdle that I was like, okay, well, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. Um, But the more I actually do it by producing, the less scary it is. It's basically a matter of, honestly, deciding what your budget is, what your budget level is what you are tending the use of the project for, whether it is actually a new media or whether what you're really intending is for a short film uh, that would go to film festivals. Because with the the contracts, like those are written two different ways. Those are two different contracts from an uh, actor or a SAG new media point of view. Really? So that's, so so that's that, interesting. I'm not mm-hmm. sure people know, I'm not sure that people understand that if, you create if you shoot something that's a new media project it's not it's not a film festival project it's not a short film it's not supposed to be going to film festivals so no and when, uh no sorry and once you change that use like say you 
like some young producers don't realize that once you make something for say the web but then you use it in film festivals or you put it on tv on something that's not public access then you need to pay all the actors because you've just changed mediums on where that like you need to pay them the base rate of i think 125 it is now Mm -hmm. that for switching to a new um, medium because that's the way the contract is written. So it's like you can either aim for a, a short film, which is, again, for film fest, or you can aim for something that's for the web, which is a new media. Or um, And there's still other versions. There's like a interactive, which is via game, or audio books. Um, you mm-hmm. know, these are all different forms that you could go to. Or something new that I have to learn a little bit more about myself is actually the... Um, SAG uh, uh, commercial because that has changed a little bit in terms of online use. So the mm-hmm. the commercials made for online use using SAG actors, I need to ver- get myself more versed in that because that has changed too. Because the again the industry is always evolving, it's always um, changing, and it's always adapting to the new situations that we find ourselves in. Where we're in the land of Hulu and Netflix now, so how do we mm-hmm. treat that? That's different from a YouTube series. How does the union view that? So, mm-hmm. well, it's it's interesting because I haven't really found very many people who've produced um, uh, multiple new media series, and I always think it's a really smart thing to do. I think it, one of the rules is it is one of the rules that you have to employ only SAG actors if you're doing a new media series versus if you're doing an ultra low budget. You know that you can employ SAG and non SAG actors. So there's so there's uh, those kinds of things. Um, those the kinds of rules those are something you can only really do learn by actually putting together a project and distributing mm-hmm. it and getting all the way from the, the from the beginning to the process to the end of the process and I haven't really met a lot of people who um and I think part of the pro- I, I think maybe because they become so successful after they do it they just don't have they just don't do it end up doing it again or maybe it's the case that they do one of each one, like they'll do a SAG New Media project, then they'll do an, a low-budget film or um, a short film, then they'll do a low-budget film. So they just kind of go from project to – so it's nice to have somebody – I'm glad that you mentioned that um, that you consult because I keep getting people who want to do those kinds of projects. And calling SAG doesn't always – they're very nice people, but they're very busy. And when you call them and you ask them questions, sometimes you've – I find my I when I've done it I found myself thinking I'm not sure I I know what I, I you you said words but I don't know exactly <laughs> what they mean. <laughs> well, yeah, it can be daunting, but the yeah the I don't know I guess I've just done it a couple times and I just I and you know uh it's a great tool for me and so when other people need someone who knows. That. I've already been there, so it's like, okay, yes, I'll use my knowledge and I'll consult with you and I'll help you um, to get from that nebulous, scary hurdle and have mm-hmm. somebody who knows the way to lead you through that. So, well, and particularly the budgeting part, because that's one of the things. That's one of the bigger, the big issues, not just budgeting mm-hmm. for the actors, but also budgeting for the the things that you have to have for the actors in terms of. Um, insurance and you know if you're working if you decide for some strange reason you want to work with you know something that could be considered stunts and that kind of stuff i mean there's rule, rule there are rules and i actually like sag i think they do a really good job of protecting actors and i really don't know what the industry would be like if there wasn't sag it would be kind of terrifying i think oh yeah yeah um i will say that thanks to smiley ridge um because of of the the contract at the time that Smiley Bridge was made and the time the contracts were written, we actually were the reason that one of the people got their SAG card, and I was so excited and happy Mm -hmm. because he was like this. uh, Marcus Hansen was a really great actor. He's uh, got, like, some really great sons. He's a soccer coach. He's a great guy. Um, When I was shooting with him, you know, I just wanted to help him out and, you know, that he got his card through that was amazing. And he was so yeah. excited to be able to make that next uh, step in his career. Cause he had been ready, but then there, it just, there just hadn't been an opportunity for him to get that next waiver that he needed. And at that time, 
uh, the contract being written as it was, I could get him the last waiver that he needed. So I was very happy and proud to be part of his, you know, ongoing success. That is very cool. Can you talk, I guess, um, as we sort of edge toward the end, could you talk for a few minutes about um, whether or not you think that the work you've done independently um, has translated into you, when you go when you go up for roles, you know, before casting directors that, you know, you've never met before, or when you're um, you're auditioning for projects, whether or not you think that your background and your credits that you've created on your own are tran translating into into a better chance at getting those kinds of, you know, those kinds of sort of more industry normal or, I don't know, studio-style studio style gigs. I mean, has it been helping sure. you, do you think? Absolutely. I mean, I just shot as, uh, last year I shot as a host for, um, uh, Lionsgate and for uh, um, Absolutely Production uh, doing a, a hostess on the street. And I think that that was in part thanks to the confidence that I had in myself because I had been through all these other things already. You know what I mean? Like after you have been, you know, the lead of your series or the lead of your what have you, there's this inner confidence and not like bravado, but just I'm here. I'm present. This is what I do, and I know what I do, and I know I do it well because mm -hmm. other people agree that I do it well. And so not only do I know it, other people know it. It shows in the views that I've had, and that kind of gives you this great platform and confidence so that whatever room I walk into at this point, you know, no one can take away that experience and that knowledge that I have, you know, the mm -hmm. fans that are uh, incredible that made that possible and might continue to watch. That mm -hmm. I, you know, I just spent three weeks talking, looping back to New York, I spent three weeks as the lead of a, uh, one of the supporting roles, sorry, one of the principals uh, for a feature film, a comedy film called Snatchers. And then I got to fly back to New York and, you know, just make people laugh for three weeks. And that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and that was through, you know, having built my reputation as someone who is funny and a great on-screen actor, because you can see all my clips. They're not hiding. Mm -hmm. They're right there. They're in that podcast mm -hmm. you can tune into. They're on that YouTube page that you can click on whenever you feel like it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that I meet after these auditions tell me that they have, you know, looked at my clips because it's so easy to Google anybody. Like that's yes. one of the first steps you do when meeting someone. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful part about having created a new media series or an audiobook is that there's a paper trail almost on the internet of all the great things that you do and all the great ways to discover you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you're you're setting out I don't know, breadcrumbs that all lead back to you, you know? Mm -hmm. So one of the, uh, another thing that I really love about that is that for some people, it's just like when I walk into a, a audition, you know, some people are like, okay, well, tell us a little about yourself. So I went in for a, a callback for a national commercial and they were like, tell us something about yourself. And I was like, well, I've had a quarter million views on my web series, Smiley Bridge TV, which I, I co-wrote and I produced it. It sounds like crazy pants. That sounds like crazy pants if somebody were to just walk in and say, well, you know, rah, 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 like National Lampoon. I do all these things. But it's because of all the little projects that you do to get to that point, you mm -hmm. know, all the little things that you've made and that you've grown and that you've shown that you can do this until now. You know, wherever you go, that's part of you, mm -hmm. and that's well, part of who you present. And I and I agree that it it means that when you stand, when you uh, you know the fact that you've given yourself these opportunities and all of these credits, and you've done it comfortably, and you know that whether these people employ you or don't employ you, you know it's just today's gig because you know for a fact that you can go ahead and build your build your own project that something's going to come along because you can make stuff come along. That gives you a lot of confidence, and it makes it so you're much more comfortable dealing with people, um, and and you have a lot more credits because you have created a lot more credits. It's at no point have you been waiting around for somebody to say, 
it's okay for you to work. You've been working constantly. And so it, I think that does completely, um, when I've hired people to, to be in my audio dramas, you know, one of the things I find that's interesting is you can tell the people they're just comfortable. They walk in the room and, and they just get to work. And it's like, and they can be merry and they can be fun, but they're very practical. They're very centered. And, and it has a lot to do with the fact that they're confident in their performance. They're, and they're confident that you're going to like them. And they're confident that they can rise to whatever occasion. And they're confident that if something really crazy goes on, that they're ready to walk out of the room. All of that really translates into a lot of just a really good feeling in a room. The more people you have that are like that. That's what people are looking for. That's what they want to cast because it translates into great performances and it cr translates into into shows that people love, you know? Right. And I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier, but just for me as an actor, mm -hmm. I think it's also enhanced those acting skills. Mm -hmm. Just the experience of just the rote experience of having done this over and over and over and over and over mm -hmm. means that now when I have to do this on a bigger budget project, I have that skill. Like I already have that skill. I'm much stronger, more confident using my acting tools because I've used them over and over and over and over again for all these different things. Mm -hmm. You know, like I just did looping for a movie and that was really a lot easier because I had had that experience Um with audiobooks. And I also did looping. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned mm -hmm. this earlier. I did looping for a, uh, this Netflix original movie called Happy Anniversary, which you can mm -hmm. see now. It has Ben Schwartz and Noel Wells. And being in a loop group it, and having somebody know that I could be in a loop group is part of, it's a great payday as an, a SAG after actor. And also, it also means that, you know, they know that I can handle it because I've already done all these other works, all these other audiobooks, all these other podcasts. And that led to a beautiful experience that hopefully will lead to another, you know, booking or another experience or what what have you. Mm -hmm. Jobs beget jobs. That's just really perfect. I mean I think that's that's like um every everything you've talked about really illustrates that it's not a it's not a mistake when people decide to take these risks, when they're performers or when they're writers or when they're directors or the producers, you know, it's, 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 sometimes it feels, I'm sure people feel like I shouldn't be wasting money on this, you know, but it, I think it, you've given, given a hundred good reasons why this kind of investment translates into a, a payoff for um, your career in the long run. It's not, it's as important as taking acting classes. It's as important, it's as important, you know, as, um, you know, making sure you exercise all the time. For writers, it's as important as, you know, taking classes at UCLA. It, it's like, it, it's a, it's a critical part of your, of your professional development and your, and your, um, your, to employ yourself is, a, is as important as um, picking up gigs from other people or preparing to do so by doing all of the things that we're told to do all the time. With your permission, I'd like to go ahead and um, see if people have any questions they'd like to ask you. So if you oh, have sure. been listening, <laughs> if you've been listening to the call and you'd like to go ahead and send a question in, please um, email them to nancy.fulton at yahoo.com. Once again, that's nancy.fulton at yahoo.com. And um, I'm going to go ahead and check because I already saw that somebody did actually send a question. Let's see. Uh, I mean, this is a question I don't know if you're comfortable answering. Maybe you could sort of give a ballpark. Um, they asked how much did it cost you to produce your um, – SAG New Media Project. So, or, or do you want to talk about sort of the ballparks that you've worked in in producing them? Well, honestly, you can work on anything um, from like a shoestring budget to to much more. I mean, I've worked on the whole spectrum uh, as far as new media goes, and it, whether as an actor or as a producer, like being on set for new media as well. Um, that's really a tough question. Like honestly, it's mm -hmm. you're uh, that's like asking how much a short film could cost. A short film could cost mm -hmm. any like it could be donated. Most of the stuff could be donated and then actors work on a deferred payment and say you had a passion project and somebody does it for like, I don't know, 
So if somebody like said the, they had like five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, that wouldn't be too, that wouldn't be too little for them to do a, a new media project or um, to start a no. podcast or any of the, or, or something like that. No, that would be that. Those are both different budgets. Those are both workable mm -hmm. budgets. Mm -hmm. I cool. like it's just what it is is then you know determining the the size and the scope of your project. So like it, it's. That's really a tough question to answer. I'm so sorry. Um, like, no, I, mean, honestly, I think you've given. I, a, I think you've given a. I think you've given a good answer in that you say you can. There, there's a lot of variation. I, if I if you say that it's possible to do something on five to ten thousand, then you're indicating it's possible to put something professional out, but you have to scale whatever yeah. you're producing in order to fit that budget. You can't put out. You know. You can't put out Apocalypse Now. You know, you can't put out apocalypse now. It depends on how many episodes you're shooting. Like, there's a lot mm -hmm. of different factors. Whether you can find people who are willing to donate, you know, a location. Like, I have that beautiful restaurant that donated a location for the day because that could eat into your budget mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. How much you're you've got budgeted to spend on on sound equipment or on your DP? How much is the lighting kit? How much is the equipment that you're using? Like, there's a mm -hmm. lot of different factors to any budget. So I will say for 5000 to 10000 you can definitely create something that you're very proud of. You just have to you know, define the scope and be clear with what you want to ultimately create. Well, that is incredibly good advice. If you, if you could um, – uh, if you were advising somebody right now and they were trepidatious about um, diving in – to creating something, would you recommend that they perhaps start by launching a podcast, or would you recommend that they start looking for audiobook work, um, maybe through acx.com or something like that, or would you recommend that they start thinking about a new media series? Like, what do you think is sort of the mo of the safest, most comfortable way to get started in um, in doing more work? Of this kind. Gosh. Okay. Well, let's see. There's pluses and minuses, and also it's about scope and about what you, what it is ultimately that you want to do and what what it is ultimately that you want to create, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, some things are less expensive. Like if you're going to create a podcast, that could be less expensive because you could use Audacity to help edit as a free edit, editing software to help edit your podcast together. Mm -hmm. Or you could buy an audio, uh, buy different things to, to audition for audiobooks on ACX. You could buy mm -hmm. a microphone with a pop screen and just audition from home in your PJs or whatever. And that would be one thing, but then to actually record it, you would want probably want to have something a little bit more uh, to help uh, get a cleaner sound out of it um, than just you know a giant space. Or you might want to like, rent a studio, or you might want to have like go to rent a studio for a few hours so the engineer can record it for you, and then. Absolutely, you know. absolutely. Like it depends on what you're <laughs> what you're looking to get. Like you know what I mean. Like there are mm -hmm. some things that. Yeah, you could audition for it on ACX, but then you also need to think about the broader picture. Could you deliver that quality audio mm -hmm. as cleanly as you want without the background, you know, mm -hmm. with the background as nice as you would like? Because, it, like, the ACX standards are, are set, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, for what they want the final output to be, which if you're a SAG actor – that's really great because they actually offer classes at SAG after to help walk you through all the audiobook preparation. And really? That's you interesting. Can schedule, yeah, and you can schedule an appointment with someone who works at the audio lab there. You can practice at the audio lab. You can have someone teach you how to finalize your audio files. All these tools are free and available for you SAG actors listening out there if that's the way that you want to go. Mm -hmm. But also, there is another point to if you wanted to do, you know, a, a web series and you just wanted it to be, you know, I don't know, you talking about, you know, like you being a talking head or just kind of like Lonely Girl, like Lonely Girl 15, where she it was literally just this girl 
talking, you know, basically doing a video diary if she's in a room. Exactly. Exactly. That could grow your audience exponentially, and that's very inexpensive as well. Like, there's – it's different ways to approach it, and whether you're doing union or not. Like, there's different pluses and minuses to each one, but there are always – and I will say this – always low-budget options for you actors, for you producers, for you directors. Please give one of these a try. If you're thinking about it, get off the bench because it's time for you to try it. It's not that expensive to do it, and I promise you, you will learn something about yourself in the process. When you produced a, when you in the past, when you've worked in the National Lampoon um, podcast, but mm-hmm. you haven't actually launched a right. um, a podcast by yourself yet. You haven't chosen to for one one, one reason or another. No, I've I have too many other uh, pots on the fire right now, so I can't <laughs> I can't do that one too. I can't, I can't have yet another. <laughs> I've, got, um, I've got all the other things. But yeah, I totally, I, to, I totally understand. At some point, you just go, well, you know, sure, and I could also cure cancer, but who has time for that? <laughs> so, um. <laughs> well, I'm also, I mean, I told you that I was a, a judge for a screenwriting competition. I've read mm-hmm. 1,500 scripts for that. Like, there's a ton of things that I'm also doing that I'm not, you know, talking about as far like all the other auditions that I do as an actor, all the other, you know, work that I do. All of that takes time. So you kind of just have to pick your pony and then make that your project for this quarter or this year or, you know, make a, a goal for yourself and then fulfill it. I think you're I think you're exactly right. Would you would you be interested or would it be okay if I asked um if people are interested in reaching out to you perhaps to consult with you in terms of um having you look at the help them sort of figure out the web series thing or consult with them on looking at their scripts and going, well, you know, those of us that only have, you know, $5,000, you know, probably aren't going to put on a whole Saturday night live level of show. So yeah, this is ambitious what you have here. Um, do you want to provide your contact information so people can reach out to you for that kind of thing? And I mentioned in passing to those that are listening, just as I always do, I don't get a kickback or anything, or and, it, and <laughs> there's no sponsorship involved. I'm basically, it's just um, when I pick people um, uh, to interview, a lot of times I pick people that I think bring skills that um, members of our group need. So, um, and you seem to have a lot of skills that people are asking you for all of the time. So. Um, do you want to provide your contact information so that people can figure out a way to reach out to you? Sure. They can email me at bf at bridgetfitzgerald.com. That's B-R-I-D-G-E-T-F-I-T-Z-G-E-R-A-L-D.com. So bf at bridgetfitzgerald.com. Or you can go to smileybridge.com and shoot me an email there. Cool. And then I think we have one last question. Um, okay. The do you when you're promoting your work, it sounds to me like you're sort of a lot of the promotion that you received for the web series, if I'm mistaken, had to do with um you being involved in contests where participation in the contest provided some level of promotion. Do you have solutions for um promoting that you think of work really amazingly well for um people who are creating this kind of independent media? Well, um, I did <laughs> – it's so crazy. I actually did work as a social media consultant uh, before for a nationally syndicated radio show. Oh. Uh, that was part of one of just the crazy history of me. Um, <laughs> so I did learn a lot of uh, tools and, and tips about, you know, making your social media voice and your impact heard more. Um, that is an extended conversation that I can hone in on more for the project. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, use the tools that you have available um, if you want to uh, create a, like, find out where your strongest supporters mm-hmm. are. If they're on YouTube, you know, support on YouTube and build that community there by, you know, subscribing and, and mm-hmm. talking to your viewers and responding. Or if it's on Facebook, then, you know, maybe that's where you should be releasing your newest videos and then mm-hmm. sending out information and, you know, providing, you know, uh, daily or weekly, depending on what your schedule and your flexibility is, uh, content for them to see, you know, whether it's 
on Facebook or maybe it's a Snapchat, maybe it's an Instagram, maybe it's a Twitter. I don't know what your brand is and what your where your biggest listeners are. So that's kind of a a tougher thing for me to do. Like mm-hmm. there's a bunch of different big outlets that could all work for you. It just depends on what you're like I don't know if the person asking is doing a drama, if they're doing a comedy, what mm-hmm. the what they are doing. But I right. can say that find out where your find out where your biggest supporters are and then talk to them there and then branch out into these other places and expand your your audience. That sounds totally amazing. So, um just I just want to make sure and I think you're totally right. It's like it's kind of like how when people ask me about social media marketing, I have a set of things that I always do that but it's but it the real issue is um that you have to tailor it based upon what the project is. I mean, in other words, if you're yeah. if you're making a new version of Barney, you know, Barney the dinosaur, if you're making a show for kids, right? Well, I don't know, mm-hmm. man. It's like probably it's like you probably may not want to promote on like Facebook because, you know, the average age of Facebook users is getting ever higher, you know, and maybe they're not on Twitter. Maybe they are the YouTube kids, you know, so maybe you to, they're in you know, Instagram and you want to do a 30 second spot because that's what they're scrolling through. You know, mm-hmm. there's a bunch, if you're doing a, a, maybe you do a podcast about, you know, home furnishings, you mm-hmm. should probably have a spot on Pinterest, like pin a couple episodes and see what happens. Hashtag mm-hmm. them with the topic of the episode. Mm-hmm. It depends on what your, what your market is and who you're trying to reach and you right. know where your market is. And, and if you don't, you should start exploring and find out where. Well, see, this is the kind of thing that's going to make you end up having to talk about marketing with people instead of producing and then where are you going to be? <laughs> So, I mean, like, it's part of the thing that you learn as you, the more you do it. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I actually enjoy marketing. I'm like, you know, I, I like it a lot, actually. I think it's a form of poetry. <laughs> but, um, oh. so, let's see. People should reach out to you at, um, give your website one more time. And, um, and you, can, is you, do you have a link on your website that allows people to contact you? Because then we can just tell oh, people yeah. to reach you through your website. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, if you go to smileybridge.com, S-M-I-L-E-Y-B-R-I-D-G-E, like smiley face plus the bridge you walk over, smileybridge.com, that's uh, pretty much my brand. That's why it's Smiley Bridge TV. Smiley was my nickname as a kid, so that's cool. why it's Smiley plus my name, Bridge. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm on Twitter as Smiley Bridge. I'm on Instagram as The Smiley Bridge. Um, but I'm on YouTube as Smiley Bridge. So... That's perfect. That's actually a really bridge. good way for for people to remember you, Smiley Bridge. But now that you said that, it totally makes sense. So cool. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us. I'm gonna for those of us for people that are listening. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'll be editing this up slightly. Um, uh, just you know to cut off the bit at the beginning, and um, I can you know we didn't have any big bad noises, so I won't have to delete hardly anything. And then I'll um make it available for Bridget to take a listen to just to make sure she's cool with it being released. And then um, I'll make it available. uh, I'll make it available to people that signed up um, uh, through the Gumroad link. If you, if you want to get a recording of this or you want to be able to listen to it um, later, you can, um, and I guess I might make it available on my podcast because I have a podcast and it's audio. That might be great. So it's a, which is audioiron.com. So if, if if that's okay with Bridget, then we'll just go ahead and do that. And then if people um, want to listen um, so that people can listen to you later if they didn't get all of the information that we sort of covered or if they want to share it with other people. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Perfect. You are an amazing person to talk to. And I um, actually do think you're going to be uh, very successful just because – you're just always finding something cool, you know, always looking for the next cool and interesting thing to do. And that's how it works, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nancy. I, I think uh, that you're going to continue to do wonderful things in this world you already have. Well, you're really sweet. I like to teach. So it's, I always feel like when when I do my events, people are thinking, this is not what other people talk about. <laughs> and I'm like, I know I'm the gearhead. I'm totally that girl that sat in the back of the class. She had glasses, you know, and she was always the one who was raising her hand. <laughs> I was that child. I'm yeah. literally that girl. <laughs> so, oh, good. I was making you laugh. <laughs> yes. No, you were doing great. You were actually truly amazing. <laughs> yeah. So we know who we, we know who we were in third grade. <laughs> anyway, thank lovely, you very much. Lovely. 
if I can be of Absolutely. service to you, reach Thank out you. to me going forward. I look forward to, you know, I can't imagine how, but when you come up with a new podcast or something like that, um, or you decide to um, produce a new audio drama or um, you do a web series, reach out. I'll tell my folks about it. That would be great. Thank you so right. much. And thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye.